uh, I've given a talk here once before, but for folks that don't know me, I'm, I'm Joseph Bobber. I'm an assistant professor in the College of Public Health here at UNMC. Uh, I've been working on uh, COVID, uh, mostly COVID sequencing, uh, COVID variant identification for, for quite some time. Um, so something that I still uh, you know, keep track of, uh, we have some some, some long-term collaborations where this, this information is still relevant. Um, so what's, what's the variant update look like? We always start with uh, the, the epi curve of COVID-19 cases. This is just from the New York Times. Uh, and uh, as, as something Dr. Lawler has pointed out multiple times on this call, you know, we are not testing at the level that we, we used to be. Um, the proliferation of at-home tests, um, people not seeking testing um, at, at the same rates that they were, you know, during previous waves, uh, during previous COVID winters. Um, so this, this data is not necessarily uh, reliable, uh, the, the full stop. Um, but what we can compare, and I think is a much better metric, um, would be COVID-19 hospitalizations in the U.S. Um, and as Dr. Lawley pointed out, these are actually dropping um, everywhere for all age groups. So, um, you know, diving into these data a little bit more is probably necessary to do, but I think it is, this is still a pretty reliable metric of, of where we're at uh, as far as, as severe cases of, of COVID-19 go. And you can see, fortunately for everyone, that, that we are actually going down and if you're looking at the, the this trend here, obviously you can you can tell where there's peaks of different different variants. Uh, here's kind of pre-vaccines, alpha peak, delta, original Omicron wave, the summer wave that we had. But a lot of the the newer the newer hospitalizations, I, I think, are probably associated with with holiday gatherings where more people are spending time indoors. Uh, we know how this works at this point. That that's that is really a, a, a big risk factor. Um, so. Uh, why, uh, why I'm actually here to chat uh, is about uh, COVID-19 variants um, and kind of the, the plethora of different, different variants that we have um, circulating across the U.S. So over here on the left, uh, I'm showing something that we've seen a uh, half dozen times before, uh, is the CDC now cast. Um, so important to point out, so some folks in, in the crowd might look at this and say, you know the the estimated percentage. I think we're it's estimating it a little above fifty percent over here. And some folks might say, well, like, well, three three four weeks ago we we're estimating at forty percent. What's going on? Um, and it's it's important to point out that the, the last three weeks here are actually just projections um, opposed to measured frequencies of of total variants. So um, basically, the, the, so we're we're in you know the week of the the twenty first, um, but the the last three weeks up until the seventh. Um, are, are now cast estimates, not actual measured, uh, measured proportion variants. And that's because there's delays in sequencing. So cases that, that come into the lab on the 7th are just now getting sequenced. Um, there's always some amount of time that it takes from a sample to go from a swab or a saliva, you know, through an RTQPCR to say that that sample SARS-CoV-2 positive, and then it has to go through some amount of, of laboratory and bioinformatic procedures to put an entire genome together. Get that data on GISAID, which is where the CDC now casts. I think it also pulls from NCBI, um, pulls from these databases and says, here's the actual measured frequencies of these variants in these different areas at, at certain times. So uh, the, the the last the last week of the year is kind of the last time we have a, a measured a measured proportion. But overall, I think the now cast does a pretty good job. You know, there's there's error bars associated with this for a reason. Um, there's another panel that you would see on this that I'm not showing um, that, that shows. You know, we estimate it's at 50%, but it could be as high as 75, it could be as low as 25. Um, and what's really interesting to, to see about XBB15 um, is the fact that it is, there's geographical stratification here. We haven't really seen that in a big, uh, a, a, you know, kind of a big uh, new variant coming in and, and taking over. I don't, I don't think there's any doubt that XBB15 will become the dominant variant. It already is the dominant variant in the U.S. It will likely become the dominant variant everywhere in the U.S. Um, but the fact that it's it, it's really taking over on the eastern seaboard and taking time to get across the country uh, is is I think pretty interesting because it, it says something about the rate at which the variant proportions are changing. And I think um, you know we've seen measures of uh, you know effective reproductive numbers RT um, as measured by each variant, um, <clears throat> and the, those estimates for XBB15 are quite high and quite significantly higher than they were for BQ1 and BQ1.1. So I think all the, the data leading up to this suggested that we would see XBB15 take over quickly. Uh, and that doesn't really appear to be the case. I think it's surely taking over, but it's uh, it's definitely taking some time to do so. And the fact that we see this different across geographical regions 
in the U.S. kind of kind of shows that uh, you know that this really you know quote unquote hard selective sweep of one variant coming in and pushing every other variant out um, when that variant is still a sub variant of the larger circulating genetic diversity is going to be a harder thing to do. Um, so just to orient you where we are where we are in the phylogenetic tree, that's how all these variants are described. It is all about the number of mutations, either synonymous or non-synonymous mutations that occur in the virus genomes. And that's what determines, you know, these this, this kind of alphabet soup of letters. So down here, phylogenetic trees rooted in the original Wuhan strain that was sequenced way back in 2019. Uh, and this is a, a time tree, so it's showing you the, the different variants over time. Uh, but <clears throat> if we were to change the axis on this phylogenetic tree to number of mutations, you would see that, in fact, Omicron, the most latest geno the, the latest genomes in the, the, the giant umbrella that we now call Omicron, uh, do in fact have the most mutations compared to, compared to this root. Uh, and it turns out that XBB15 is down here because it is a recombinant uh, of, I forget the two BA2 sublineages. Uh, but someone was co-infected, those, those genomes stuck together, you have half of one, half the other, uh, and that's what, what created uh, XBB1, and then it gained another mutation in the spike gene that's, that's relevant for um, receptor binding, as Dr. Lawler has shown, and that's what made it XBB15. Um, so what I'm showing you here is from this uh, website, outbreak.info, and this is measured prevalence over time. So again, different than the CDC now cast, it's using some modeling to project variant proportions into the future, this is, this is measured prevalence over time. What you can still see is that there, there is kind of a, a, an Omicron soup of sorts circulating in the US. Um, so this is, you know, the, this would end basically at the start of the year. Um, and you can see that there's a, a, a decent amount of uh, uh, variability associated with this um, that probably has to do with slightly lower sequencing numbers. What we can see is XBB15 is in fact steadily rising as BQ1, BQ1.1, and BA5 are going down. So we are seeing this increase in XBB15 in measured proportions, but I think it's a useful exercise to compare this, uh, and surely some mathematicians are doing this right now, but you could compare the, the rate or the slope of this line, right, and the rate of this proportion increase for XBB15 compared to everything else, and then compare that to what we've seen for other major lineage is causing you know large selective sweeps across the US. The first was was the alpha variant that we saw come to about 65% of cases. So up here is just the the newer the newer variants uh, projected out over the entirety of the pandemic. And down here is just referring to uh, alpha, delta, and omicron. What you can see is that the you know alpha went up quickly and got to about 65% of all cases in the US at the time. And we thought that was remarkable. Um, but then uh, it still took months to, to get to that, that level, um, where Delta did it much quicker and got to near 100% frequency. If you can remember way back when, there was Delta and then all the AY sublineages of Delta. Uh, but that still also took weeks, weeks or months to get to this 100% frequency. And then if you substitute Omicron in at this point, you can see how you know, it's almost a vertical line, how, how quickly Omicron, Omicron came in. And it was literally a matter of weeks before it was first detected until it was making up 100% of the cases. Now, importantly, when we're saying Omicron here, we're referring specifically to BA1 and BA1.1, uh, which were those first two major uh, sublineages of Omicron, as Dr. Lawler's pointed out. Those viruses are very different than the viruses that are currently circulating, which is why I think we're seeing increases in cases. But it's worth pointing out, and again, surely there's mathematicians doing this somewhere, the rate of increase in this slope is much higher than it is for XBB15. Uh, and I think this has something to do with, uh, you know, complex immune backgrounds in the population um, that are going to let, I think, XBB15 surely come to dominate, but not in the same way that BA1 did um, back uh, in about this time last year. So it's, it's taking over. I think it's clearly taking over. But as this is showing, uh, it's not doing it at the same rate everywhere. Um, and uh, it, it's, it, I think that's an interesting phenomenon to see because it also may leave room for whatever the next variant is. Uh, as Dr. Lyle pointed out, CH1.1 uh, is circulating in the UK. That is also a BA2 sublineage, um, which is interesting um, because uh, BQ1, BQ1.1, and BA5 are all BA5 sublineages. Uh, and BA2, while much more similar to BA5 uh, than it was to BA1, was still pretty different. So, uh, you know, there, there is a fair amount of circulating genetic diversity still in any time. There's a lot of circulating genetic diversity 
uh, that that means evolution can select for things, uh, and that's that's surely what's going on now. Um, and then last, I, I wanted to point out this preprint that just came out. Um, I'm not an immunologist, so I'm just going to put pictures of slides up and let the, the, the immunologists and the folks more attuned to that sort of data uh, in the room look at this. Basically, what they found is that um, there's waning immunity against XBB15 following the bivalent mRNA boosters as measured by monoclonal antibody titers. Oops, sorry. Uh, so here they have baseline showing that, again, the, the bivalent boosters work great against the, you know, kind of quote unquote wild type SARS-CoV-2, uh, less well against all of these variants that we know are immune evasive. Uh, but what they show is that about three weeks post bivalent booster is when they saw a peak uh, in the neutralizing antibody titers. Um, uh, that was highest for, for XBB15, uh, about three weeks uh, post booster, and then that dropped uh, about uh, you know, pretty precipitously three months post booster, which I, I don't, I personally, I don't think I'm surprised by this data, but I don't know if I should be surprised by this data or not, because I'm not an immunologist, um, but they, they are showing that, that neutralizing antibody titers drop. That's, you know, I, 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 again, I don't think that's terribly surprising, which may suggest that the bivalent boosters aren't going to do a great job of protecting us from infection. But what they point out importantly is they also measure uh, CD4 and CD8 positive T cell responses to bivalent boosters and saw that there's a measured increase uh, in T cell proliferation um, at, at uh, three months post infection. And what the authors uh, deduced from that uh, is that this, you know, may, these bivalent boosters, while they may not provide lasting protection as far as neutralizing antibodies go and protection from infection, they think that uh, this could indicate that these bivalent boosters will do a great job of protecting people from severe disease, um, which uh, personally, how I've talked to uh, my loved ones, people in my family, people in my circle about why they should continue to get boosted. Um, they will often say, well, you know, people that get the vaccine still get infected. Why do we need to get boosted? I always immediately go back to data like this that suggests uh, these boosters absolutely help protect us from severe disease. And I think it's a really important communication tactic. So. Uh, that's all I have. I will happily take any questions if there are any.